If you are into radio control hobbies, then more than likely you've come across the need to solder. It's one of the more difficult skills, but really something that you can learn just with time in the saddle. So today we're going to talk about soldering, go through some tips that I have for you, the equipment that I use. I'm John Holmes, and today we're going to cover soldering. So today's video, I'm going to do some soldering for you. And specifically, what I need to do is put some motor leads, or I guess just the four millimeter bullet plugs on the end of this revolver. This is a revolver 540 in the 1800 KV, but it comes without motor leads, or at least the, the uh, plugs on the tip. So I'm going to install some four millimeter plugs. Our list of things that we need to complete this today. First, of course, we need the item that we're soldering. We also need plugs, and I am using our four millimeter compression style plug. You also need some heat shrink to shrink around it, or you can use tape. You will need a lighter or a heat gun. We typically use a heat gun, but I didn't bring one with me today, so I've got a lighter. Then you need some sort of jig or a stand to hold it, just to make it easier. Of course, you need the soldering iron. Today we are using the Hakko FX 888. This is the old analog version. I do prefer the analog versions to the digital versions because when we go in between different soldering amalgams, I can just quickly switch between them like that and you don't have to hold and press and then watch it overshoot it and go back and uh, I don't like the digital ones, let's just say. At any rate, that is what we're going to use today. You also need some solder. We have some lead-free and leaded versions and then also some sort of wire stripper or a crimper uh, most of them are going to have a uh, side cutter built into them as well. So I've just got kind of a one and all. And then last but not least, we also need some safety glasses. I think a lot of people overlook it. I know I do in the shop quite a bit. But when you're soldering, a lot of times the wire can kind of flip back at you. And I've, I have had my face sprayed with solder many times before in the past. So always a good idea to put on safety goggles. Because without vision, it's a little hard to solder. So let's see, I think that's all that we need. Uh, only thing I didn't have and I don't need is scissors. So a lot of times your heat shrink will come in a roll and uh, it will be much longer than you need. So you'll need to cut it into little strips like that. But that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. So I will get everything ready and then we'll be ready to go. Today I actually won't be using these because everything is already cut to length. So what I'm going to do first is put our four millimeter bullet plugs into this little jig that I have made. This is made out of steel and we just used a quarter inch drill bit to drill into it. Now I have this nice fancy looking jig here and you might wonder, well, why aren't you going to use that? This is a Mr. Jig. I think I picked it up from Hobby King. They're fairly inexpensive being Chinese materials, Chinese made and Chinese sold. It is very inexpensive. But the reason why I don't like this is because it is a block of aluminum and the aluminum heat sinks really fast. And so it can be extremely difficult to actually get things soldered without being a cold joint. So I prefer the steel. The heat transfer is much slower and it's just an easier job doing it. So today I will be using our solder that we have made for us. It is a lead free with 6%, no, 4% silver in it. So it's a, a fairly low melt temperature for a silver amalgam, 96% uh, tin, 4% silver, and then it is a rosin flux core. It, I should also note that this is 0.032 inch diameter. You can see fairly thin compared to what is normally found out there, 0.06, 0.062 is the standard size. You can really see that there's a, a big difference in the diameter of the two. It's a lot easier with a smaller diameter to put it on just as much as you need, but no more. Getting too much solder can make a, a poor joint just as badly as not having enough solder in there, but I find it's easier to add more than to take away. So we have this made. All right, so the first thing we want to do is pre-tin all of our joints. So I am going to heat up these bullets and we stick solder in between the iron and the bullet itself. We're trying to get a little heat transfer, kind of like a little, uh, I can even do it from up here. There we go. So I'm just going to pull a little solder in there. And normally I'd be doing this in front of a, an exhaust fan, 
But as you can see, once we get the heat transfer going, I'm not actually adding the solder to the iron tip. I'm adding the solder to the bullet plug. Yeah, and I'm, I'm definitely used to having an exhaust fan in front of me. But the exhaust fan doesn't have a whole lot of light and the studio does. So we're just going to we're going to deal with some rosin fumes today. That's another reason why I do not like using leaded solder is that the fumes, uh, technically the lead shouldn't be in the fumes, but uh, I, I really don't trust that lead is not in the fumes and I, I don't want to be huffing lead fumes. I also solder so much that I do, I do not want to go home and be bringing lead home on my hands. Uh, oh, many years back, I got a, a fancy microscope and I had been soldering all day with leaded solder. I had washed my hands three times and just for giggles, I decided, hey, let's see how good of a job I washed my hands. And I uh, looked under the microscope and there was lead, little balls of lead in between the ridges of my fingers, uh, inside my fingerprint. It had burned itself in. Uh, no matter how much I washed, it just wouldn't come out. Uh, and lead does absorb through the skin. Uh, so that was the point to where I decided no more leaded solder for my personal projects. We can't use it for uh, shipping out anyway. Uh, we can't ship into most other countries in the EU. We can't ship out into California with leaded solder anyway. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm pre-tinning these leads. Although they already have solder on it, it's usually a good idea to get the same amalgam on both items that you're going to be soldering together. So this is you know just kind of a little bit of fresh on there. I should also note that I run about uh, 450 Celsius for a lead-free solder. Uh, that, that usually does a pretty good job without getting too hot and causing issues. If I was using a leaded solder, I'd turn it down to about 380 or so. So now we go back and we preheat the plugs. And I want to make sure that the solder inside this plug is nice and liquidy and you'll just have to take my word for it there we go she melted and then basically we just shove this this lead down in there and wait for them to solidify together looks like i may need to actually add a little bit more solder to this not quite enough solder for the job that i would like so just add a little more not to the tip of the iron if you can help it. You, you want to add it in between the iron and the object you were soldering at first to get that heat transfer going. And then once the heat transfer is going, once it says wet it out, so to speak, then you add it into the device that you're soldering or onto the device directly. There we go. That's real nice. That's real nice. And I usually kind of wiggle things around and you can hear the wires start to squeak when the solder's all melted in between. And then we just need to hold it real steady while it is coming down in temperature until it solidifies. And that way we'll get a nice solder joint that is not a cold solder joint. A cold solder joint has poor conductivity and is also liable to break. It's another reason why you should have your iron nice and hot. Now while I'm doing this, I should mention that we do not use this Hacko iron in the shop for production. We used to. It's a really good brand. They hold really good tolerances. You may find some knockoff versions on Hobby King or eBay, uh, but you do get what you pay for. You're going to have uh, lower quality components in a knockoff. It will not hold temperature very well. It may not be anywhere near accurate on temperature, um, which can be really frustrating. Probably won't have as good heat recovery. But what we do use in the shop is the Zytronic LF-3500. It's 150 watt iron versus uh, this guy, which is just 65 watts. But it also has a much larger tip. And the extra mass really, really helps uh, when you're soldering, say, a motor like this. This is a, a Puller XL. So the Puller has big, beefy solder tabs on it. There's gonna be really big, thick wire coming off of it, but inside the motor, there's a lot of copper. 
and a lot of steel, it will wick away all of your heat. And with a small iron like this, the only way to remove or change the length of the wires at the solder tab is to literally preheat the motor in an oven and get the motor up to say 150, 160 Fahrenheit, let it really heat soak for a while, and then immediately solder it. If you don't have that luxury, you, you'll have to get like a, an old school 80 watt iron from your local hardware supply store. But we use that, that Zytronic, which is spelled X-Y-Tronic. We use that at the shop because it does have the thermal mass and it does have uh, enough wattage for a fast recovery. Because otherwise we, we simply couldn't do the work without getting two irons on it at a time, which is kind of funny. Right, so as you saw, I added the solder to the parts that I was soldering. I heated them up good, and of course I'm cleaning the tip. Um, if you look down inside here, we've got what's essentially like a, a copper steel wool or a brass steel wool, and every time I need the tip cleaned, I just kind of shove it in there, and you, you may be able to hear the, the, the squeaking of a clean iron. Yeah, there we go. So that's that. We have this licked, so always remember to turn off your iron. If you have a fancy iron like the LF3500, it actually has a 30 minute timer on it, which will tell you, hey, you haven't been around for a while, it'll shut off, and then when you pick up the handle, it actually has a motion sensor in the handle, uh, it'll turn right back on. And the recovery time is really fast on those, so you know it's maybe a minute to warm up. So I will wait for these to cool down just a little bit, so that when I slide the heat shrink on, it doesn't immediately try to shrink down. I'll get these guys out of the way. We are done with those. Yeah, we're good now. And then we add the heat shrink. You can, of course, use a, uh, uh oh, I got a little solder on the actual plug down there. I don't know if we can zoom in on the camera, but this is what you want to avoid is getting solder on the actual plug body where it slides in. And more than likely, I can just take these cutters and kind of scrape it off. A little sideways action, there we go. Yep, and that should be fine, as long as it doesn't get down into the little slots. If you wick some solder into the slots, you're done. Your plug will not uh, go together. That's, that's pretty much, uh, I mean, it happens. I've done it plenty of times, even though I've been soldering since I was fifth grade, I guess, is when I started learning to solder. And it's really just one of those things, time in the saddle. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, steady hands really helps. Having a, a, a jig, a third hand tool, something like that, if you don't have steady hands, it really helps. And as you can see, we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of the flux onto the table, which uh, another thing I should mention, do not use, do not use acid flux on electrical connections. If you have the ability to clean every bit of that flux off, then it would be okay. But an acid flux will corrode over time. If you have a multifilier wire, it's going to soak up into that wire and it will corrode that wire over time and uh, you give it enough time and it'll just simply break the wire. I I've seen it happen. Uh, for example, if I did acid flux on this instead of a normal rosin flux, it would soak the flux up into the wire, down the wire, and then wherever it would stop, then over time that would start to corrode and get uh, you know eaten up, so to speak. And, and with the flexing over time, it would break right there and just separate. Uh, so do not use acid flux on electrical connections unless you think you can totally get it clean. And uh, unless it's a, a single wire going onto a single object, you can't. If it's got a multi-strand wire, multi-filier wire, you will not be able to clean it. So what we're using looks to be, let's see, I use my, use my, my fancy measure in here. Uh, it looks to be about a 12 millimeter or a half inch, 50% shrink. Uh, typically I would go with a little bit smaller of a shrink and also use a heat gun instead of a lighter. That's uh, just a little easier to do without burning things. But we are using what we have. And this is what we have. Uh, we have a 100 meter roll of this stuff, so we're going to use it. 
if you use tape by 3M electrical tape, do not use the cheap stuff. The cheap stuff will slide over time. It will get really gooey and messy. Just, just get 3M tape. Get, get the stuff on the, I believe it's yellow on the interior when it's uh, to code. Super 33. Super 33, yeah. That's the stuff. And, and I, I typically try not to use electrical tape on these connections just because it's not nearly as clean as this. And this doesn't look that clean because I'm using a lighter, so we're getting soot on there as well from the butane. But this will do. And uh, I, I put this white paper down so that you would see the mess that it would make. A lot of times there'll be a lot of little solder balls. We've got a lot of, of the rosin that would normally embed into the table. Uh, so this is what gets on your hands. You may not see it, uh, but this gets in embedded into your hands. And so it's always a, a great idea to wash it off thoroughly before you uh, touch your loved ones, touch your kids or your wife or anything like that multiple times. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I looked at my hands underneath the microscope one day after using lead solder all day, and it was so embedded into my fingers that I couldn't wash it out. I used a nylon brush, it wouldn't get it out. I used a steel brush and it still wouldn't get the little bits out of in between my fingers. And I wish I had something to show y'all that, uh, but unfortunately I didn't take a picture. I was so grossed out that I just kept washing my hands and kept washing my hands and uh, just basically called it a wash after about 10 times when it wouldn't get it out of my fingers. It, it literally had seared into the flesh. And that was lead that I ended up ingesting over time through, through my skin. Uh, so do not use lead solder if you can help it. Uh, it's just not really recommended, especially if you're doing a lot of work over time, it's gonna be bad for your health. That's the one takeaway that I can have besides this being just a practice situation. Just don't use lead solder. It is easier to use, but over time you will end up getting lead poisoning or, I mean, even if you don't get poisoned from it, you're gonna be a little bit dumber. And that's never a good thing. We, we wanna be as sharp as we can in life, I feel. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I didn't pose any questions to y'all as I was going along, but if y'all do have any questions, feel free to post them below and I will get to them. So appreciate you tuning in today. Have a good one.